Okay, I would say I can start briefly introducing John Street, Professor Street, who of course uh, doesn't need uh, uh, a long introduction because uh, all of us probably we know already, we see. And uh, uh, Professor Street uh, um, teaches politics at the University of East Anglia and he is also honorary professor fellow at the University of Melbourne. Um, he teaches politics and media and politics and popular culture and uh, um, many other, let's say, um, uh, um, disciplines. And he is the author uh, of uh, um, over and co author of seven books, uh, including uh, uh, the, some very famous ones, uh, among which Music and Politics in 2012 uh, and, and, and many other. It is important also to, to, to stress that the next, uh, the new edition, uh, the third edition of his Media, Politics and Democracy, is due to be published in, in, in now, in May 2001. And uh, he was also awarded by the prize Best Article Award uh, for his article on celebrity politics, which is uh, one very popular concept among those scholars who focus on these, uh, on these uh, issues. So, I don't want you to, to, to spend more, more words. Uh, I will leave immediately the floor to uh, Professor Street. Thank you for being here today with us, and thank you for your work, your book. Uh, do you want an help for uploading your presentation? Or do you have a presentation actually to be uploaded or, or is it just uh, without slides? What do you... I, I have slides, can you not? Um, are they not showing at the moment? No, they, we don't see them. Uh, in it, what do you have to do is to, on the um, right side button. Yes, yeah, no, I just did that. Oh dear. Okay, don't worry. You we can you you can uh, it is show now, present now, and then you have to share your screen. And then if you have the PowerPoint open on the desktop, it should be visible. It's say yes. Ah, oh, good. Yes. Perfect. No, no I can't. <laughs> okay. But you can see that the full side. Yes. Uh, now we can see. Yes, we can see them. We see them, and we see also the the, the all the other participants. Of course, uh, please, uh, if you can switch off the video, all the others in, in order not to have a, a too heavy online connection, and then we can switch on again uh, after the talk. Thank you, Professor Street. The floor is yours. Thank you very much and, and thank you for those kind words and for this extremely kind invitation to speak uh, and also to thank everybody who took part in the uh, events today on, uh, on the project Popular Music as the medium for the mainstreaming of populist ideologies. I learned a huge amount today and I feel uh, <clears throat> slightly humbled by the quality of the presentations I've witnessed so I'm sorry not to be able to, to match them. Um, anyway, my talk has this title, Songs That Changed the World, question mark. And I perhaps should explain where that idea of music or songs that can change the world. It comes from uh, an event that took place a couple of years ago in the days before the pandemic, when uh, the University of East Anglia, my, my university took a, a tent to uh, the music festival that uh, takes place not far from where uh, my university is based. It's attended by about 20,000 people. And uh, on a rather distant field at the festival site, we had the, the University of East Anglia tent at which we were celeb celebrating the university. Obviously, it was a recruitment effort, I suppose you'd say, but we were doing so by highlighting the fact that University of East Anglia has a history of, in fact, uh, quite impressive gigs on campus and in its uh, smaller venue in the city. And so we were, as it were, selling the university. And you might say this was an example of something called the popification of the university. Uh, this uh, trying to uh, recruit students uh, by means of a pop festival. And in order to justify our existence there, we were asking people what their favorite gig had been that they'd ever, they'd ever attended. And I was drafted in together with some of my colleagues to uh, try and 
find other ways of engaging the audience at the Latitude Festival. And I came up with this idea that uh, we should have a kind of quiz or a, in this case, a knockout competition, rather like a football competition to decide which gig had changed the world, which uh, pu public performance of popular music had changed the world. And we offered them these choices. We offered them Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock. We offered them the Sex Pistols playing their first gig in Manchester. We offered them Stravinsky's uh, 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 Rite of Spring in its first performance in Paris. We had Bruce Springsteen playing in Berlin. Uh, we had Pussy Riot in Moscow. We had Daniel Barenboim playing Wagner in Tel Aviv. We had the Nelson Mandela concert in Wembley, London and Rock Against Racism. We had Beyonce playing in uh, the Super Bowl. Uh, and all of these events were reported by journalists and others as having huge significance uh, in some way or other changing the world, whether it was the Sex Pistols kind of creating punk or Pussy Riot in some way or other destabilizing Putin, whatever it was, there were these claims. And we were asking people at the our festival, out of these, you know, and we had them in head to head competition, which one wins? Um, and the answer, perhaps rather disappointingly, was Live Aid. That the event that they, the people at Latitude Festival, thought had changed the world most significantly was Live Aid, rather than all these rather more ex explicitly political events. But it was, I think, an interesting demonstration of the thought that at least some people, particularly people who go to a festival, would credibly engage with the thought that a live performance might change the world. A live performance of music could make a significant difference. And this, I think, is a widely held view that music has got some kind of political power and that this power expresses itself in different ways. And those pictures in, in front of you now are perhaps illustration of it, but I also would mention the quotations that come underneath it that illustrate, I think, the different ways in which music and politics have become connected in ways that suggest at least that music has some real power, power to in some way or other change the world. Uh, there is a quotation from Lavinia Greenlaw's uh, autobiography about the importance of music to girls in which she uh, says punk did not save any whales, but it made itself a force for change. It believed in something after all, and singing along, we believed in it too. There's a kind of the sense of the autobiographical experience of music changing the world. And underneath that is uh, Joseph Schumpeter, uh, who in his Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy, written in 1942, uh, sorts of slogans and marching tunes are not accessories to democratic politics, they are the essence of it. Now, Schumpeter was a skeptic about democracy, you might say, but he at least acknowledged its, the importance of music to, to democracy. Then you have below that uh, a, a, an act of, or a bill currently being debated in the UK's House of Commons, which is intended to restrict protest where it becomes noisy. Now, it doesn't specify music, although previous pieces of legislation have outlawed repetitive beats where they're trying to uh, uh, police uh, uh, were labelled illegal raids, but the thought that noise threatens the power of certain authorities or certain people is still live and is being acted on in the case of this particular bill. And then finally, uh, 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 an article written by Don Letts, who was a, a key figure in, in, the, in the punk movement in the UK, talking about the proliferation of protest music in our current era and the thought here is that protest music matters people who want to say things about the state of their world use music to do so seems to me all of those examples speak to this thought of music having the power to change in political sense and by way of illustration here are two uh, songs by one by van morrison one by captain scar speaking to the experience of covid and uh, lockdowns and 
our current uh, unfortunate circumstances. It's illustrating, I suppose you'd say, the thought that music is used as a vehicle of political expression, um, that it is uh, not, uh, you know, uh, to be treated simply as a source of pure entertainment. I had added in yesterday uh, that uh, those lyrics up on the right hand side, as I look at it anyway, um, I could leave you to guess who has written these lyrics, which are also speaking to the experience of the lockdown. But I'll put you out of your misery in case you were in any way interested in who wrote them. It was Sir, Sir Mick Jagger was responsible for those. His latest single is uh, Reflections on the Experience of, uh, of, of Lockdown uh, as it's been for him. Now, what I think is interesting about the fact that people choose to write about their current circumstances, their political experiences, is that this has a long history. That this isn't just a phenomenon of the 20th and 21st century, it's a phenomenon that we can find in the 19th century as well. Um, in the era of the smallpox epidemic, uh, the song, uh, the lyrics for which you see on the left were uh, widely circulated and you can see the cartoon of someone fear, fearful of the implications of the vaccine that was then being used uh, to counter smallpox and below it obviously a headline from a newspaper talking about the current version of that, the anti-vaxxers and their campaign. And all I'm doing here is illustrating this longer history of the protest song as it relates, in this case, to um, the, the experience of epidemics. Now, it is this long history that explains my current uh, research interests and the things to which I wanted to give some attention today. I'm involved in a research project which has the title Our Subversive Voice, the History and Politics of the English Protest Song, and I'm working with a team uh, Dr. Angela McShane of the University of Warwick, Matthew Worley of the University of uh, Reading, and Alan Finlayson and Oscar Cox Jensen from my own university. And this project, which is running for the next couple of years, is to look at the history and politics of the English protest song. And you might ask why? Why are we doing that? Well, in part, we're doing it precisely because we wanted to show that there is a long history to this song, this form of political engagement or political communication. And why are we looking at England? Well, we're partly looking at England because we don't want to look at the United States, which has already had its history of the British song extensively uh, documented, but also because uh, issues of English nationalism and so forth have become very live. So it, I think, provides an interesting history to, uh, or an interesting focus to that uh, question. But what we're also interested in is the seeing the protest song as a form of political communication, something that for political scientists, it seems to me, uh, has not always been at the centre of their attention. Political communication has typically focused on perhaps the more traditional forms uh, of, 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 of communication, often the visual and the textual, and that less has been said and less has been examined uh, of the musical uh, or sound uh, more generally as a form of political communication. And I think, you know, one of the finest examples of that is a track by Dave called Question Time. Now, I'm not using the soundtrack here because I didn't want to risk the technical problems that might be um, uh, caused by that. But that song where he interrogates the, the, the government over its failures to respond to a whole set of injustices and iniquities is, it seems to me, a very fine example of that. Uh, form. Uh, and indeed, Dave uh, subsequently went on to perform another song uh, called Black at uh, one of the big music award ceremonies in which he inserted uh, uh, a verse uh, accusing our Prime Minister of being a racist. Now, the research questions we are asking are about that the long history of the protest song. We're trying to see how this particular form of political communication has both changed and remained the same over its long history. A long history which takes us back to uh, 1603 and goes up to the present day. 
And what we're trying to do is understand both what that history has contained, what the history of the protest song has involved, but also what circumstances have led to its creation. What, what is it that brings the protest song into existence? And how does it acquire meaning? What, what does it end up saying or seeming to say? Um, we began this research uh, back in, in October of last year. And uh, uh, the first thing we've done, the first phase and what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about now is trying to, as it were, record that five centuries of history uh, of the protest song. Uh, we started by just simply looking at historical sources and some of my team are experts in particular eras of, of the song and we assembled a list of some 750 songs which uh, span uh, those centuries uh, and we've sought subsequently to refine that 750 to 250 a kind of top 250 of the 750 um, the reason we're doing that is partly because that's what we said when we made the uh, submission for our, our funding. Uh, we said we would reduce a list of 250 to illustrate it. But what's interesting is, is, is the fact that you can, at least with, with little difficulty, assemble 250, uh, 750. Uh, refining them to 250 was a challenge. Uh, and we did it uh, by consulting other people, other experts in the field to say, look, have we included the right songs? What do you think? We had about 50 or so uh, experts in the field contribute their recommendations and commenting on our selection. Uh, the, the history runs from a, a track, a song called Come All You Farmers Out of the Country, which is uh, an attack on the uh, awarding of knighthoods for no very good reason to uh, local farmers and the like and is an ex actually parallels our current political climate in the UK where we're talking a lot about something called charmocracy where friends and uh, and and, and uh, allies are being awarded uh, vast contracts for various aspects of, of the dealing with the with covid to uh bob villain uh, a song which is uh, explicitly addressing the um, uh, politics of immigration we were not trying in selecting these songs to uh, provide a, a, a complete history such a thing would be impossible uh, i don't think it is uh, possible to record every instance of political song that the definition of the word political almost prevents that. Uh, what we were trying to do was both represent time, in, in other words, giving fair uh, expression to, to the various decades and, uh, and centuries, and also to identify interesting examples of the genre or the form that is the protest song. So this is this was the exercise. We we will be accused. We I'm sure we will be accused of missing out all sorts of uh, important examples of the protest song and we will be guilty as charged uh, it will simply be that we will be saying look what we're trying to do is offer an illustrative history what we were trying to what we were faced with as we tried to come up with this list were definitions of the word protest song of the term protest song definition of what it counted to be english and what it might mean to call it a song. Um, one of the very obvious issues with trying to provide a long history of the protest song is that actually it has a very short history. The first use in the English language of the term protest music is 1949. The first ex use of the term protest song, 1953 and the first example of the use of the word pro or the term protest singers is 1966 so as a as a phenomenon it has a a, a post second world war history it is important to note by the way that there is a german expression protest lead forgive my pronunciation which appears in 1848 so there is a longer history to the term protest song than it exists in the English language. And indeed, that example of the 19, 1848 German song, in which it's talked about as enlightenment through repetition. 
So what we were faced with in trying to produce this much longer history in which the, the term protest song might still be applied, even though it wouldn't have been used in its in that context was to identify the difference between songs that were merely pro were, which were protesting and songs which were expressions of resistance and we were looking at songs which were co directly complaining about the state of affairs uh, rather than merely commenting on them and that in commenting on them they were not offering any obvious response or solution whereas the protest song or the complaint song as we label it is offering some response and attributing blame uh, rather than merely commenting so we were also making a distinction between songs which were merely lamenting the state of affairs or expressing sorrow or indeed even just in the english language expression whinging about the way the world was it was a, we were trying in some way or other to identify songs that sought to uh, as it were articulate and describe some kind of political change as a consequence of the objections they were raising what we were also wanting to make sure we did was to to have a very ex, uh, inclusive range of genres we did not wish to see the protest song simply as a folk song which is often being uh, understood to be and we did not want only to include songs which were commercially available although they are predominantly in our list commercially available songs but we did want to ensure the range and just by way of illustration we have there examples of songs that were both included and excluded we excluded a rather brilliant song by the the, uh, the um, dance duo cold cup called timber because actually there are no words in the song and it it, well, it is a protest at the state or uh, the way in which uh, uh, our woodlands are being destroyed and trees are being destroyed uh, but you would only know that from watching its accompanying video and that the music itself doesn't give you any indication as to what it is about we've also included though noel cowards don't be let's be beastly to the germans from 1943 which uh, one of our commentators said you can't possibly include Noel Coward it doesn't fit what you understand to be a uh, proto singer he was you know a member of the, of the uh, you know performing to, the, to to people dressed in uh, dinner jackets in in exclusive London theatres this isn't a proto singer by any stretch of the imagination um, but we've included him because in a sense he spreads the range of songs that we can include we've included elvis costello shipbuilding although we had many arguments about that because although it appears in at one sense to be a protest at the falkland war which england uh, britain engaged itself in in the early 1980s it also expresses the dilemmas of that in, and talks about the fact that actually war means there's work for those living on the northeast uh, shipyards and then we have classical music in the form of michael tippett's child of our time we have Screwdriver in there, who are a kind of far-right, racist punk band. We have Sue Gilmurray, who no one will probably have heard of, precisely because she is an amateur songwriter who, who writes songs in direct response to the politics she finds around her. But it's important tradition. We have not included the Rolling Stones satisfaction, although one of our consultants said, this is the great, iconic protest song how can you not include it but for us it didn't say anything other than i'm not happy it gave no sense of what it was that you were unhappy about and what might be done to solve that so that was the kind of argument we didn't include van morrison's no more lockdown but we didn't not include it because van morrison comes from northern ireland who therefore is not in that sense quotes english um we included we didn't include it because it is a terrible song uh, with an opening line which is no more government overreach and we thought this had no we were trying also to illustrate the, the quality of song that could be articulated in, in the protest form this is a very crude representation of what we found across the 750 in which we were trying to break down those songs which i as i'm mentioned can't be claimed to be a representative sample but what you will notice there over that the predominantly songs that speak to the state of britain or state of england in particular or to the political process that's the orange uh, segment or the blue segment they were the ones that uh, dominate the history the political process 
overviews of the state of England. What is interesting, to an extent, is if you break this down over time, what you will see is that in the pre-1789 period, uh, there is a great deal of attention given to the political process, the orange segment. And as time goes on through those different phases in the history of English politics, you might argue, the political process becomes less and less the focus of the protest song and the overview song assumes ever greater prominence. So there's a kind of political shift in the focus of the protest song over, over time. Uh, what is largely consistent is the attention given to war and peace. That remains largely stable, you might say, across the period, 500 years, but the other, other, other elements become more or less significant. And this very crude <laughs> diagrammatic representation of the historical changes to the protest song lead obviously to a question about where do they come from? Where do songs come from? And one of the things that we are trying to do in our project is, is ask that question to see what it is that leads to the production of, a, of the expression of protest through song. Um, and one of the obvious ways you might look, places you might look is, is conscience, and the other obvious place you might look is context. Uh, in other words, how it is that singers feel about the world and what that world is like. And of course, there is an element of that. And we can see that perhaps in the way those diagrams reflect the ones I just showed, reflect certain political wider political changes. But for me, I've always been very impressed and intrigued by work in cultural sociology, which has argued that those sorts of rather crude uh, correlations between either the conscience of the artist or the context in which songs are being written do not properly explain why they occur or emerge and it's that difference that you might say between exogenous and endogenous change or causes of change certainly this is one of the things that we want our project to explore is whether indeed songs and, and popular culture emerges more because of factors working within the process of production than from outside it and Richard Peterson's fantastic article called Why 1955 on the origins of rock and roll, in which he argues that the, you know, it was rock that shaped the political events rather than the political events that shaped rock, um, is, it seems to me, a really challenging thought and one that's worth exploring. And I, the same sort of idea comes out of Stanley Lieberson's rather wonderful book on the, on the way in which children's names have been selected over time and whether they reflect the context in which they are being chosen and he argues they're not that fashion uh and, the, and and by which he means the choice of name follows very different patterns from what is happening outside in the world and that's that thought that is in some way or other informing our project we're trying to see whether the cause of political song and, and as a form of political communication can be understood in terms of, of factors working in a sense within that process of production broadly defined and, and, and in this context politically defined so for example you know the constitutional form of a country can perhaps determine the um uh, opportunities for political song um uh, I take inspiration here from about a book uh, which I've written about on other occasions by Paul Chavigny called Gigs, in which he records his own experience as a lawyer def uh, challenging uh, the zoning of, uh, of New York, which in which it was certain size of jazz group was being prevented. So you couldn't have more than three instruments on the stage. And what was interesting about Paul Chavigny's challenge to that rule was he took it as an instance of an, a you know uh, of a breach of the second amendment the right to free the first amendment i should say the the, the, the right to free expression and he argued that the right to free expression included the performance of music and the kind of instrumentation that music contained seems to me that's a wicked powerful thought that might inform or be used to inform an understanding of how the protest song gets written and when it gets written the second thought is that institutions and particularly electoral 
par, par, uh, electoral arrangements, party uh, structure, uh, and so forth, they too might play a part in the opportunities they, that are created for the protest song to emerge. That more fluid political structures, less stable political parties might create greater opportunities for the protest song to emerge, or the absence of political parties might give it greater force. The role of law, and famously in the UK, the introduction of something called Form 696 was used by the Metropolitan Police to prevent the performance of grime and music, which itself was heavily orchestrated in terms of protest and so forth. And then the role of intermediaries, the role of journalists in kind of mediating what constitutes protest and what constitutes, constitutes political move, music seemed to me part of this a wider story that takes us beyond context and conscience to think about how it is that political song and protest song gets made. But what also struck me uh, and would strike others, particularly in your department where you have this extraordinary expertise around social movements, is the ways in which theories of social movement and pol political activity concept conceptualize music differently. Just as I might argue that theories of music conceptualize politics differently, that we can see politics through music differently than we might see it uh, through the traditional language of politics. But it is those ideas that political theory uh, itself speaks to a different account of what it is that a song is doing and what music entails. And that thought, uh, was recently brought home to me by an article in the unlikely place of the Financial Times where they uh, drew a distinction between the dem use of music in uh, Poland uh, in the anti-abortion rallies and in, um, I'm sorry, in the pro-abortion, the pro-choice rallies and uh, the uh, Extinction Rebellion uh, protests. And what they were drawing attention to was the use of techno music in the pro-choice rallies in Poland as being all about the body and, and, and putting the body at the centre of the protest and music that articulates through the body as being very important to its capacity to protest. Uh, and contrasting with Extinction Rebellion, where the kind of folk tradition uh, was more prominent. But the thought here is that types of protest and types of music are connected, and I would say types of protest theory and types of music. So one of the things one notices if you look at social, social movement, and I know that I'm talking to people who know far more than me about this topic, but all I'd say is it does, looking through some of the social movement theory that talks and speaks to uh, the role of music, depending on the theory, constructs song in particular differently. So song sometimes can come across as an instrument, as a tool, by which movements, as it were, achieve very specific ends. Songs can also, in a different theoretical frame, become forms of expression, that they, as it were, speak to the causes that that movement might have, rather than op operate simply as an um, uh, as a tool of a particular end, I, you know, whether it be you know, engaging members or whatever. A third set of Theory, theorizations, particularly those associated with Ron Ehrman and Andrew Jameson, construct the song as, as, as in some sense, articulating a history and a cultural tradition, which then gives meaning and, and, and relevance to the movement. And then finally, there is the work of, of Kevin MacDonald, in which the song becomes, becomes the politics, becomes the political experience of engaging in protest. And it seems to me though, that this idea that the theory of politics in, it constructs the, 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 the music is a powerful and important element in what we're thinking about when we're trying to uh, decide whether songs change the world or not. There is, though, a criticism of all of those approaches, which comes from uh, work by William Roy, in which he argues that the trouble with those kind of ways of thinking of the song is it only sees them from the perspective of the audience what it is that led to their being created rather than uh, rather to be heard rather than being created so the song the perspective that all of those theories of social movements have is of the song as as it's heard rather than how it's created or performed then roy wants us to shift attention to that 
And he says that it's understanding songs as action. This is what takes us into this thought that songs do things, is to understand them as acting in the form of organizing. That songs organize people into certain kinds of relationships and in certain kinds of actions. It's not just the process of consumption, it's a process of doing. And it is in doing music making that the commitment is solidified and that collective action achieves its aim. Uh, and, and you get that same uh, idea offered anecdotally by Lavinia Greenlaw in her book on the importance of music for girls. If we could come together, make this noise, and she was talking about her, and take up this space, then surely what we had to say would make something happen. And that kind of belief of performing music as having, the, in, even if it is only a, in the form of singing along, is actually creating relationships that change the world. That's the, the thought that Roy wants us to have. Now, in his book on song as, uh, as action, he draws a distinction between two movements, one organized by the, the Communist Party and the People's Songsters, and the other, the Civil Rights Movement and its use of song. And he argues that the, the Communist Party involvement in songwriting in the People's Songsters movement essentially controlled the degree of political activity that subsequently fell, followed from it because it was so top down. Whereas he argues that the civil rights movement's use of uh, an engagement with song had a much more collaborative form to it, which made it a more effective sort of political engagement. And that, underneath it, I've put in two examples which have draw, we've drawn from our own research between, on the one hand, you and Nicole who was uh, very closely associated with the Communist Party in the UK, who used to dictate to his uh, fellow songwriters what they would write their songs about next week. So he would say, I want two songs from you about the Vietnam War. And I'm contrasting that with an organisation called Raise Your Banners, which is there to encourage and enable amateur songwriters to write about politics. And it's the thought that, that uh, uh, Roy has that in some way or other the different forms by which music gets created affects the kind of movement and therefore the wider effects on society that results. I, I'm, I'm offering this very tentatively but it does seem to me to suggest an interesting way in which songs become action and action becomes change. My second, as it were, plea for the defense of this argument comes from a wonderful book by Noriko Manabe, in which he writes about the protest movement that, and the protest music that followed on the Fukushima, Fukushima um, uh, meltdown in Japan. And what she does there is she contrasts live and recorded music with in, and paid and free music. But what you want to look at is the, 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 the bottom and far uh, right uh, parts of this matrix in which she's suggesting that there is the degree of participation varies depending whether the music is live or recorded or whether it's paid for or it's free. And equally, the degree of con confrontation that results from it is different according to whether it's free or paid for or live or recorded. That sort of, and it's these ideas that I'm uh, wondering about at least uh, as to how we might make songs as action uh, a, 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 real, a real entity in our understanding of the role of the protest song. Um, my time is running out, but let me take you. The, the kind of criticism that might come from this is that songs are not really about organizing. And that idea I take from Simon Frith, in which he writes in Performing Rights, the most significant political effect of a pop song is not how people vote or organize, but on how they speak. And in this sense, action from songs come in speech acts, to take Jay Austin's term. But the idea that actually songs do have a, an active effect, but it is in what it allows us to say, how it allows us to speak. Uh, and you know, I've there quoted some famous sort of expressions that come from uh, uh, songs over time in which, uh, as it were, we are being allowed to speak by virtue of the song. Um, what Frith is arguing then is that songs should be understand, understood as forms of rhetoric 
or oratory, or at least the lyrics of songs should be understood as. In other words, these are about moving people and presenting the world to them in very particular ways. That's what rhetoric and oratory does. And one of our the experts on our team is someone who is a, stu is a, 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 a scholar of rhetoric. And that's why they're involved, because we want to look at song as rhetoric uh, and uh, as drama uh, in Frith's other ways of capturing the role of lyric in song. And what this seems to suggest is that one of the other ways in which protest songs or songs of politics become action is in how they claim to represent those they're speaking of or to. And the different ways in which songs speak of, of the people and speak to the people and how in performing the song you are in a sense also summoning into existence a people on whose behalf or in some way you speak uh, and taking the fr anchor smith's uh, idea of politics the aesthetic politics that involves the representing of the world through rhetoric and oratory and style prayer so what you get then uh, in the way you might start to look at lyrics as rhetoric as oratory as representation uh, I have three examples of song here. Uh, one which is from Ewan McColl and Peggy Seeger called The Ballet of Accounting, which is in our 750 but didn't make the 250. But what's interesting there is you read the lyric, it's the way the audience is being asked difficult questions by the singers. In other words, the, the, the issue of who is speaking here is being, uh, is, is in a sense, the interrogatory role is being played by the singers who have this slightly superior relationship to their audience and are asking these questions what did you do did you do enough have you have you have you acted as you should uh they're always playing on your conscience and then they're, they're, i'm contrasting that with a different form of song as representation uh, dave question time i referred to earlier in which he dave speaks to to the prime minister on our behalf asking certain kinds of questions of her, it was Theresa May, her behaviour out there in the world. And then finally, uh, there's the song Wildfires, which is about the Black Lives uh, Matter movement, in which we have both we and you in play in the lyric. Well, I'm bringing these to you only in the way of saying how lyrics can claim forms of representation, how they can differently relate the represent the representative and the represented, given that that is, if we take Frith seriously, this is the role of singer to audience. Uh, it is some form of political representation that is being enacted, and it can be enacted differently through the ways in which lyrics, as it were, engage or represent the audience uh, and the political cause. It wouldn't be fair, it wouldn't be right, to end, without, uh, to end without drawing attention to what might be obviously vulnerable in much of what I've said. Uh, I quote, first of all, from a recent book by Timothy Hampton on Bob Dylan, in which he says songs are most political when they are not talking about politics, uh, which would suggest that the approach that we have adopted is completely misconceived because where politics is to be found is to be found outside of that area of the song where politics is made most explicit a second quote which are the next three quotes are all taken from uh the same book by bill flat where bill flanagan interviews songwriters and here you have elvis costello telling uh, an anecdote almost against himself that his song about shipbuilding that is completely misunderstood and misinterpreted as a song about going boating and going out for a day's uh, sailing. Um, there's David Byrne, formerly of the Talking Heads, obviously, talking about how the, the, the song, songs don't easily accommodate, if it's going to be any good as a song, politics. And there is Bono saying that he has no idea what half his songs are actually about. All of these, in some way or other, as it were, take digs, I think, at the way we're trying to analyse song. And this is an exercise in self-criticism. But of course, all exercise in self-criticism 
ends with us saying, but we're still on the right track. Uh, we do think it's really important to draw attention to the long history of the protest song. One of my colleagues, Angela McShane, recently wrote of a song. It was catchy, singable, memorable, and commercially produced that it's increasingly constructed uh, itself as an agent of popular politics. And she was writing about a song called The Parliament Routed, which was first performed and made available in 1653. And although she doesn't talk about the music video, because obviously 1653, there were no such things. But what she does talk about is the ways in which the woodcut that printed that song and the typeface that was used to, uh, to type out that song, to, to print that song, did, it, did themselves tell us something about what that song meant and how it was to be understood. And of course, while we write about the, that long history, we are engaging with definitions and distinctions that many will find controversial and, 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 and want to challenge. But we do believe there is a long history, even if the term protest doesn't apply throughout. We also think there are important questions to be asked about the origins of song that require us to link political theory to songs and song making. And that we do think, I think, that songs as action, as both organising and as speaking, are the source of a political effect, whether in the cultural form or in the style that they've adopted. And that was to take from Frith and from Roy, those sorts of arguments. And therefore, it leaves me optimistically claiming that songs can indeed change the world. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, John, for this um, incredible presentation. And uh, so thank you, Ori, for, for, for if there are many, many, many ideas now uh, circulating. Uh, around and uh, I will open the floor to all the audience uh, if you want to uh, ask if there are questions and uh, then of course if I can also have I also have one so but, uh, let me before to see if uh, the public uh, wants to ask something I see one let me collect uh, some more questions before Okay, I see Melanie, and uh, of course, if you want to book, uh, you can uh, raise your hand or write uh, in the chat. Yes, Melanie, please, go ahead. Um, thank you for this really inspiring lecture. I have a question about uh, the selection of the songs, and probably that's often the first question that you get. Um, I'm wondering about, um, about gender in the selection here, because I see a risk of producing a sort of canon of what is important, and you also have quality as one of the criteria for selection. So I wonder about uh, female protest songs, for instance. So can you say something about alternative perspectives in there, anything about diversity in your cor corpus selection? Um, I haven't had that question before because this is the first time I've talked about our project. But um, you're absolutely right. It was one of the things to which we were about which we were most concerned: the, the degrees of diversity that we were able to generate. And and we have one of the things we did precisely because we were not seeking to be quote representative or comprehensive or any of those other things. We made a point of trying to identify. Uh, diversity in, in variety forms but obviously around a male female for example was one of those elements of diversity that was being represented and it is true it is true that f women singers are, are more prominent in the amateur tradition than in the professional tradition and they're more prominent in the more recent era than they are from the previous year but i mean we made a particular point of representing songs that emerge in the suffragette movement in particular. There's a lot, there's a very, very extensive use of song as part of the suffragette movement. And there are also other songs, earlier songs of, of women complaining about their particular circumstances that uh, uh, we found in, in these earlier centuries. And then, uh, then there was a tradition that um, emerged around the Greenham Common 
uh, protests, which were about the location of American nuclear weapons in the UK and the, the women who surrounded that camp, they were also prolific uh, performers and composers of, of songs. So they're represented there. Um, and, and then there are other elements of diversity too that we are trying to, to represent. But it, it, it was it was a challenge. I'm not sure whether we've met the challenge, and certainly, when when we and we will make these lists available on a on a, on the website, uh, which we have, which uh, we're just commissioning. Um, but I I will fully expect that we will be uh, properly criticised for our failure to to be uh, truly representative or or properly uh, uh, inclusive. Okay, thank you, um, Professor Street. And now we have also Mario Dunkel, and then I see one uh, question in the chat. So I don't know if you want to read uh, simply the question and then uh, answer to the, the person, Gaia Romano posted something. So up to you. If you want, uh, Mario, uh, ask your question, and then we can hmm, also collect okay. the one uh, of Gaia, and you can answer to both. Thank you. Okay. Uh yeah, thank you so much, John, for an excellent talk. That was fascinating. Um, I, I have a question that goes into a similar direction to uh, what Melanie just asked. Um, I was wondering, um, since this, this, this form of the song is so important, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about what constitutes a song. And I was reminded of, of um, Ronald Rodano's uh, book about the constitution of black music um, in the 19th century. And there he talks about the slave songs, the so-called slave songs, right? Um, and he, his, his argument in that, in that passage is that um, the slave songs were also an invention of white, privileged, university-educated song collectors. Um, because before they were written down as slave songs, they were music, <laughs> right? Um, and they turned them into songs by writing them down. Um, they actually had a different form before. So what does that now mean for, for an approach where you look at, you have this long durée approach where you also look at songs and you know, the, the 17th century, but they were, they had a different function in the 17th century, right? Songs. So, um, um, so how can you then, or, or does that also lead to sort of like a, a racial bias maybe that's also in, in like part of looking at, at, at the form of the song? Um, because isn't there also like, you know, a Western sort of bias in how the song was constituted, the form of the song? Um, okay, I'll, I'll stop here, but like those questions, I, I would be interested in, in those uh, negotiations. I'm, I'm sure you also discussed them in, in, your, in your team. So, um, yeah. Uh, well, Mario, thank you for your question. That's great. I mean, are you, you're, you're right in, in, in all sorts of ways about the, the, the struggle we had as to what it was that constituted the song something that i of course naively assumed would be a simple matter but it wasn't and and your apps and and it in a sense one of the reasons we we started in the 1600s in the 17th century was this was the point at which song and music becomes commercial for the first time because you have publishers of songs that you didn't have previously and, and, and in a sense london becomes the, the one of the first places in which the kind of com songs are traded and so forth and we were in a sense starting our history from that fact rather than from the 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 the, the, the fact of songwriting as, as far as we someone has asserted profoundly that the first the instance of someone being executed for singing a protest song was 1381 so you know way before we even begin our project um but you're right yeah there there are issues around uh who you know how songs are recognized when, what gives them public presence and my i wish my colleague angela mcshane was here to help me answer this question because these this is the period and these are the issues with which she is very familiar but it is undoubtedly an issue that certain kinds of song and certain kinds of performance are probably written out of the kind of way or there's danger of them being written out of the kind of history and the kind of definition we're we're deploying i mean we in a more contemporary example we, we there is uh linton quasi johnson is included in our protest list of protest songs although his song is you might say poetry because there is no musical accompaniment to it but it's understood as a song uh, 
in because it simply you know it has that form in in terms of its its, its lyrical structure it's not poem in in the sense that you might define a poem but it's a fine line and it's not an easy one but it is a way of, of trying to produce some kind of inclusivity but you i think you're very you're onto a very powerful point as as money was as to whether this this approach will provide us with a proper a fair or proper representation of the phenomenon that we're interested in do you want me to answer gaia's question yes there is a gaia i don't know if you want to read the chat can you read the chat yeah so she's just asking whether the protest on production depends on the degree of difficulty of the time or the freedom to express the right about political issues is there a peculiar difference with political songs in victorian age i mean it is one of those issues to which we are giving attention and it is clear that in and particularly in the earlier period that uh, the regulation of songwriting and the uh, and and the imprisonment as a consequence of songwriting and so forth is is a real issue we, we one of the things our approach and indeed i think is uh, a consequence of the uh, very thing we're trying to research is you can't you can't really measure quantity i don't think you know uh, i was saying this earlier when we were talking about the project that that to say how many political songs are in existence or how many political songs might have existed if there hadn't been this regulatory structure in place is impossible to answer i think but it is clear that forms of censorship and regulation the policing of song over time has undoubtedly had some kinds of consequences at least for the punishment of songwriters if not for the existence of the song itself but it, that's undoubtedly true it's also true that you know the the, the, the form in which songs emerge uh, differs according to the age and, and the victorian age obviously with the, with forms like the musical produced a very different kind of song to an era post-war of, of of the folk club or whatever and so these institutional spaces are obviously also part of the story but whether any given i mean it's certainly true that you get these i mean the in the british press every year it seems somebody will write an article saying what's happened where is the protest song what's happened to it as if somehow someone's been keeping a record of how many protest songs there are at any one time and they suddenly notice there aren't any more around it's never true but there is somehow a feeling we have that there are fluctuations in the extent to which the protest song or song political song is is present in the world and 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 when it fades away but as i think we were talking today you know that definition of protest song would suggest that the, of the definition of political song it's just mapping it in those ways is almost wholly impossible and probably not very helpful thank you so are there other questions i don't see anyone else okay i um uh, there is probably me is it correct? Is it Anna? Anna. Anna, yes. Anna, yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, also from my side, for this very inspiring talk. Um, uh, I was intrigued by the last slide um, that uh, songs um, are most political when they are not talking about politics. And um, but you mentioned such. Uh, maybe not a song, but this, this techno music um, at the demonstrations. So I was wondering, where where were you looking for protest songs? And this is also a follow up question uh, to my colleagues questions, because um, there there seem to be uh, songs that are have been selected on on the basis of, of lyrics. Uh, but then there are also songs that have been selected on the basis of their use value uh, within a protest you, you are absolutely right that that, that uh, in terms of the arguments we had and we had fairly intense arguments both with our consultants and with ourselves over what songs we wanted to somehow use <coughs> sorry to represent the um you know this long history and you're and you're right that some songs in, were included precisely because they were lyrically interesting i mean they just were not typical of the ways other protests political songs had been written other songs were chosen because they uh, were part of a genre that 
typically gets left out of the story of the protest song or the political song, including you know, techno. We also were looking at you know particular historical events where we knew, as it were, there was uh, confrontations, controversy, and looking at, at where the songs that were associated with those uh, might be found. We looked at you know uh, history, books of hit standard books of history. Did they refer to song in, in telling their narratives? We looked at uh, specialist uh, music books that were you know, tracing in the case of, of, of British hip hop, for example, or, or, or so forth, in order to, to try and... We were, we were just trying to, to be as, 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 as... I mean, scientific is completely the wrong word, but we were trying to be kind of systematic in, 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 in trying to bring together and because actually what this is is it's an exercise in in polemic almost it's saying wake up and recognize this important tradition you know and it includes all these things and don't think this is representative and don't say if you're going to you know it and, and that was what it was but you're right and 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 so we did look specifically at dance music because we thought that people will ignore that unless you know and so we had to find it but it, dance music is really difficult because mostly it isn't lyrical there's no lyric there that you can identify and because we kind of focused on rhetoric that made it different and difficult because i think it is difficult to talk about rhetoric where there is no lyric you can but it, you know we felt it was a limiting factor so you know i'm just and i'm just saying we failed but we we have tried thank you very much so um, if there are no other questions, I, I would explore uh, the, the, my role of uh, moderator to, 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 to also to raise my question. And um, as a last question, so don't worry, then we will free you. <laughs> and now uh, my question is, uh, uh, he wants to be, let me say, uh, more analytical. And uh, of course, uh, it was uh, extremely fascinating, everything. Also, this project is incredible. So I, I really look forward to when you have uh, um, collected some data or started to publish something on that. Uh, if we, as a department, we could be informed and, and receive uh, like a paper or something. Now, my question is uh, about. Uh, I was very interested in the questions that you have uh, uh, in the project. So the songs over time, the condition of uh, its uh, creation, the source of its uh, uh, meanings, uh, and I was wondering if. Uh, we could add um, um, a fourth question concerning, in particular, the mechanism through which uh, they are effective. So if songs are protest, can be protest, what are the mechanisms through which uh, they can become protest? In part, you already answered. Because when you said about, when you uh, commented about the relational resources that songs provide, this sound me also familiar according to um, uh, social movement theories. Now, I was thinking immediately about the research mobilization theory, eh? which says that uh, uh, in collective mobilization to emerge needs uh, uh, symbolic and material resources, and therefore songs uh, can uh, um, uh, provide the occasion to count the number of people, uh, we are a mass, but also provide the cognitive and relational resources. However, I was also thinking about other insights that perhaps uh, could use as mechanism, but I don't know. So I would like to, to listen to you from your great experience in these fields. Uh, on the one hand, for instance, emotions. So sociology of emotions uh, are telling us that emotions are particularly important for political participation, in particular collective political participation. Is it one right direction that we could analytically use or and ident collective identity so songs uh, are important because they provide collective identity which is a precondition according to many sociologists for collective action or what else so i was really um yeah i was uh, looking for your um, immediate answer from your experience mm -hmm. to which kind of analytical uh, uh, explanation of mechanism we could refer this effect of uh, music into progress. Thank you. Um, well, I'm afraid I'm not, it's going to be another 
disappointing answer really but but i think one of the what i think we would like to be doing what you are proposing and and, and particularly looking at, at at how emotional i mean the kind of emotional effects and and, and discourses of, of the proto song and the, and the kind of resources upon which it could draw and one of the one of the issues that was raised uh, when we applied for this grant you, we got our initial phase of feedback one of the things says well you haven't got a musicologist and which was right we don't and 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 it is a legitimate criticism we, you know in many senses if you know if i did it again i it would have been right to have had a musicologist but in a sense our our response was well you know there is a musicological project here that sh you know and that should be done but we weren't the people to do it we were the people who were trying to see how the proto song could fit into a rather conventional picture of political communication in which it's true you know emotions particularly of anger and frustration are conveyed in the form of song but i suppose that we we probably don't or won't be able to deliver uh, the kind of thing Manuela, you, you're talking about which I, much as i would like to because i think it would be uh, an enriching of the process but and much of and the what you those of you involved in that and the, the, the project on mainstream populist ideologies you you are i think with your mga analysis and so forth providing the kind of data that we are not going to be able to produce as to how songs are as it were having effects of the kind that are really important to engagement with politics um maybe we'll get a follow-up project where we can do that but i think it's true to say we are we are not very much for focusing on uh, as it were how how musical intent or how political intent is articulated through through song rather than how musical effect is achieved although as i say you know through its powers to organize and through its powers to speak we are uh, indicating the kind of grounds that we think that effect might have okay thank you very much although for the uh, musicological group analysis we have done you have to thank uh, Andre, Andre, who is one am among the founding fathers of the method, so we simply apply them, probably not in a fully successful way. By the way, thank you very much to everybody. Today it has been a long time, a very dense day for us of the research project meeting. Thank you for, for all the um, other people who joined us in this talk. Thank you once again to Professor Street and hope to see you again in presence and so physically so no later in florence well, that's see you, you. and uh, let's uh, see you tomorrow uh, with our uh, project partners uh, bye bye thank you also i want to add uh, to our uh, excellent uh, ufficio event who is uh, continuing to, to, to which is, which are which is continuing to organize events on, although everything now is online so that the they, they require uh, double uh, work and everything. So thank you to Valentina and Alberta uh, as well. And Enrico, of course, uh, who, who coordinated everything. Bye-bye.